As for the reviews, though, to us. It's been uh, very generous this whole year. Uh, special thanks go out to uh, Pearson Friends Hall, Mark Cobbs in the audience, Ed Fox. For those of you who are interested in writing a review of one of those books, please uh, drop us a line. We're always looking for people to do that. Does anybody have any announcements? Yes. Go ahead. How are you doing? We're trying to, or not trying to. I came back from California last week. We uh, have, uh, NYLTS has a yearly conference in upstate New York called uh, Freedom IT. We've been doing it three years now, and we have a marginal success with it, but we are trying to extend it into a much more successful uh, program. Um, so I went to California, and I spoke to some people out there, and we're going to make it national, and we're going to get support from a variety of people in, out in the Bay Area, including Rick Moen and Miss Don Marty, by the way. This was on vacation. And um, and the people doing you both out. So uh we'll do it All right. And uh Storm Walker, anyway, Storm Mark Walker. So um, we are looking to uh, we're moving forward on this. I have a call for papers which I have a preliminary uh, uh, preliminary uh, uh abstract. Yeah, abstract, I'm we'll call it an abstract that my daughter managed to send by twenty times from now. It's my list so you can pick up one of those and read it. If you have any comments on it, please uh, do that. We just put up a new mailing list for it, it's, uh, <laughs> which I will uh, post, or I'll have my daughter post and send it on dialogue at this point. Um, and, uh, and I hope that people will get involved and come in for some serious uh, free software conferencing on a very serious and high level in uh, Lake Placid, New York, uh, coming February 9th to the 12th. And if you haven't been to Lake Placid, if you spin the globe and try to find the most beautiful place in the world, that's Lake Placid. And you may think it's in the Caribbean, but you're wrong. It's in Lake Placid. And I got pictures to prove it. And they'll be going online. So it's absolutely fabulous, fabulous place. You would drive in Lake Placid, and immediately you can just feel your attention just immediately removed. It's like walking into a spa. It's just unbelievable. It's unique in the world. Of course, the Olympics was there, and they have facilities and so on and so forth. It's just a great, wonderful place to be. So, uh, and being that cell phones are virtually dead up there, you can be able to be up there and conference about having your boss nag you, so that's a good thing also. Um, so that's it, and uh, it's a feedback. I need volunteers though. Yeah. All right, that's it though. All right, stay tuned for more details on the State New York trip. Mark? Yeah, Delhi is just meeting again next month, uh, actually this month, October 18th, and the subject is virtualization. Uh, so if you want to come by and uh, or the, if you don't already know about it, if you do, tell me. I can do more information. But uh, if you want to know more about it, uh, come to the meeting. It's at the New York New Yorker Hotel on 8th Avenue between 34th and 35th Streets at 6.30 on the 18th. What, what kind of virtualization specifically? Well, actually, you know, it's going to be first covers the basics of virtualization since this is a desktop room. And then uh, specifically, I'm probably going to show virtual boxes in effect. Version 1.4. I've got that on my uh, Ubuntu uh, system, so uh, it should be interesting. Okay, 
cool. Before you sit, Mark, can we get a little blurb for the Python group? Uh, well, I wasn't there last night. I was waiting That's to right. about something. <laughs> and uh, uh, so Peter were here. Uh, Peter's not here. Yeah. Uh, I know the Python group meets every other week, uh, a bit last night. And we'll meet again, uh, hopefully, uh, two weeks from yesterday. Um, apparently, uh, especially if I'm not going there, then other people aren't going there. It's, it's, uh, it's interesting to be waning, as, as Peter put in his, his email last night, which I got a little too late to uh, respond to. Uh, but uh, people who want to know how to use Python and have used it before, have some interest in it, or who are experienced at it, because one of the projects is the Nylog website, and they're using the Django as a content management system. And based on Python, so anyone who wants to buy and help with that. Or if you just hate our RSVP system. <laughs> yes, speaking of which, by the way, it says, you can change, it, says, it says you can change your password, but when I try to change my password, it says I, don't, I haven't given it the proper information. I, I, I know my name, I know, uh, I know my first and last name, and I know my, uh, my, my username on the system. So what is telling me I don't know? I'm not quite sure. Uh, it may be that we have discovered that the, in some cases people have spaces after their names that were not trimmed off. Well, that's a really tough thing to do. <laughs> hey. Okay. We had it written. What do you want? So, I mean, you should do something. <laughs> someone should do something about that. So they, you know, I'll take a look at that. Match on it's a course, there. I think our page should be built in there if you like. Well, there you go. Volunteers? Anybody who wants to write code in Python? Come on down to the library. Python and 1% of the dialogue. Uh, come on by in uh, two weeks from yesterday and uh, uh, you know, can help Peter with some of that stuff. All right? If you don't know Python and you want to learn Python, well, that's me to come here. All right? So, right, I have here the next meeting for the Python workshop, October 23rd from 6 to 8 p.m. Held uh, at the Hudson Library at 66 Leroy Street in the West Village. And we are uh, canvassing actively now for volunteers to write code. Uh, to help with the organization and the meetings. Um, honestly, this is something that we're putting in some time now. If you want to help out or get more involved, you can find me at the Stumpfish or um, during the meeting here, Ron Guerin, any of us, or write us um, at the email on the mailing list. I forgot the other mailing list we have. And I like workshop, and I, and I like social, and I like volunteer is where we uh, want to get a lot more activity going. I um, want to also just thank our own especially Ron Guerin behind the camera, who really puts the most effort into what's going on here and makes this stuff happen every single month. Peter Norton, who can make it tonight. Tony, John McCall, uh, Jack Lubel, and Larry Cubney, who is handing out the badges to them. So, we're going to go until about 8 o'clock, and afterwards join us for uh, some refreshment and, and uh, talk over at the hog um, pit down the block here to what we call the Stammtisch. So let me introduce our speaker, <laughs> finally. Um, Sonny Duty has been a uh, longtime member of the New York Linux Users Group and uh, a core exec at one point. A major contributor has given talks here as an expert in virtualization as well as audio tonight. We're going to learn all of the nuances that we perceive audio by and how we can manipulate it using Linux. So, without further ado, please give me a really warm welcome, Sunny. Thank you. Hi guys. Some some of you know me, or even some of you don't. My name is Sunny J. I've been doing Linux for the last maybe 11 years now. Whenever. Uh, uh oh. Hold on, guys. Oh. That's right. You look good on the right one and the left. Now you're good. You're good. There we go. Yeah, cool. I've been doing this for maybe 10 or 11 years, whatever Red Hat 5.2 came out. I've been a fan of uh, trance and DJ genres for maybe a equal amount of time, maybe even earlier. And tonight we're going to talk about audio on Linux because. Uh, I can't stand Windows, so I do. I try to do everything I can on Linux. And at the end, we'll see where Linux really alters and where it's headed and why it's headed that way and so forth. Since I is such a massive topic, I only have like a whole hour to talk about it. There's a lot of detail that's going to be cut out. But if you think there's something valuable to contribute to the discussion, that's something I might have forgotten about. Please, like you know, raise your hand and I'll call on you and just 
until it's, you know, this stuff. So, the, the purpose of this presentation is not to take audio from, like, your stereotypical audio file perspective. It's to take it from the perspective of people who love music, which is most of us. You know, we listen to it whenever we can, whenever we have a chance to, and so forth. That's what this is about. We're not going to talk. I, I just read this, like, two weeks ago or something. It was the funniest thing I've ever read, or one of them. It said, uh, music fans listen to music, audio files listen to stereo. And I thought that was very interesting, because it's kind of true. I also would like to point out that there are no right answers, that we all have a different taste in music, a different way of playing it. Some of us prefer vinyl records with our analog interconnects, while there are some of us who prefer our CDs with our digital interconnects. And there's some of us who think all medium should be dead, which is how I agree, so. I don't know, there are no right answers. The goal is to be informed about making the right decision. It's not to know everything. You know, like some of if, if there are audio files out there who know everything, you know, like it can tell you the difference between a nineteen ninety Yamaha reference speaker and a nineteen ninety one Yamaha reference speaker. That's not the point. The point is to make informed decisions so we can go out there and spend the right type of money buy the right type of material and equipment and enjoy music that much more without windows, you know? And finally, we live in a really big, crowded city with lots of people living really close together. So it'd be really great if people were more respectful, respectful with the whole loud music thing, you know? If you live in a tiny apartment and you decide to blast music on a Wednesday night, there might be a guy, you know, next door studying for the exam Thursday morning. Hmm. You know, so seriously, let's, let's all try to be nice about it, you know, because it's so easy to go out and buy incredibly loud audio equipment and drive your neighbors nuts. But that doesn't work. That doesn't make us happier people. So we start off by asking what is sound, because as dumb of a question it is, like we all know what sound is, it's still important to review. It's still important to go over the basics so. of. So sound, if we think of it as waves, right? It looks like this. When I clap my hands in a billionth of a second or whatever, all this air between my hands got pushed out. And so it compressed the air into a ripple that eventually hit my ears and I heard it. Ooh. So sound waves are a way of representing how we see air compression go along. The wavelengths here represent the pitch, and the amplitude represents the volume. So when we have our wavelengths like really, really, really tiny, it means that the pitch is higher. But when we have our wavelengths really spread apart, it means the pitch is lower. And the amplitude is the volume. So when our amplitude is only this high, our volume is only this high. And if it's this high, it's this high. I'm oversimplifying, I'll get to it a little bit later. But that's the gist of it. So to describe volume, if you will notice here that uh, the first, the, the two curves here, sine curves as they like to call them, are actually the same except the amplitude is changed, meaning the pitch is the same, but one's louder and the other isn't, meaning one will travel a greater distance and the other one won't. I am over, so like for those of you who do know this, I am oversimplifying it because the pitch changes as well. It's not just a, it's not just a mutually exclusive sort of ordeal, but for now let's assume that volume and pitch are mutually exclusive. So pitch is the same concept though. Here, you'll notice that the amplitude is the same, but it got squashed together, the wavelengths got squashed together, meaning that the bottom curve you're looking at is significantly higher in pitch than the top curve is. The bottom curve is like, you know, the one that will break glass, the top curve will do nothing. Uh, so, music and sound in general and the way we perceive it to be, is lots and lots of different curves coming in at all different times. For instance, right now, one of them is coming from uh, the amplifiers of your speakers from, for this. But at the same time, we can all hear the air conditioning in the back. And so they keep coming together, and it's the brain's ability to take all these abstract sounds and make sense of it that makes it worth it, which is what computers don't get to figure out how to do. And so when you start putting all these different sound waves together, you end up having lots and lots of sounds cancel each other out, extend each other, and so forth. And that's what music is. You could think 
of the yellow uh, curve here as like, you know, the drums, and the first blue curve at the bass, and the second blue curve at the guitar, and together, they're all coming together. You're at a concert, and you're hearing all these sounds at the same time. And what happens is that they come together in a fashion that cancels each other out, complements each other out, and you have one curve, which is music. This is what you're listening to. If you guys have ever used a lot of uh, consumer, well, I was a consumer, but you know, like your Winamp and your Armor Rock and whatever else, this is essentially what you're looking at. You know, they have those uh, little visualizers, equalizers. This is what you're looking at. It's the whole curve at the end. So, music is, is uh, measured in, t in terms of intensity. It's called volume. It's actually wavelength time uh, multiplied by the amplitude. And decibels is a logarithmic scale, meaning it shoots up in a curved manner. So the difference between 10 decibels and 20 decibels is not the same as the difference between 20 decibels and 30 de decibels. The order of magnitude high. Thereby saying that small differences count a lot. To get a better example of this, Zero means like near total silence. You can't hear anything anymore at all. 15 decibels is what a whisper is. <coughs> Excuse me. 60 is regular conversation. It took a difference of 45 decibels to go from this to this. 90, very only more, is a whole lawn more. 110 is most near city clubs, which I'll get to a little later. 130 decibels in when, when you start experiencing pain in your ears. 140 is a military jet takeoff. So the next time you watch like a video of a jet taking off or a movie of a jet taking off, you'll notice they'll always have the most massive earlobes for really good reason. And 160 is near instant preparation of your eardrum, which is pretty bad. So in New York City, we are one of the clubbing meccas of the world. This is kind of interesting. 80 decibels for a few hours was a result in permanent hearing damage. You might not notice it, but after a while, it'll build up and it'll build up fast. Most clubs average at 110, and a lot of them will average at 125, 130. I used to work for a company called Digitally Imported, and we'd go to the clubs and I'd get to see, they always have these uh, meters and stuff. And I remember one night it was like solid 125, you know, and I had to deal with that for eight hours. And there's actually a word for it where when you come out and you have that reading station that doesn't go away for hours, that's the result of this. And the reason I write six to eight hours is most clubbing events that people do pay good money to go to are six to eight hours. So people are experiencing real hearing loss at these events, and the loudest place in the club is the DJ booth. And this is a guy who gets paid to do it like weekend after weekend after weekend. So you assume, you know, people like him have like eardrums of steel or something because they have to, it's pretty bad. So, yeah, that's it. What'd you say? Well, it's funny you bring this up, because in the world of clubbing, there is a very uh, famous group of artists called Above and Beyond, and they've actually taken a stance against what they believe is excess volume. And if you go to their website, it will actually sell you high quality earbooks. That's their stance on it, and I think it's kind of funny. So, if we continue, into the sound. Let's think about this for a moment. I think house music is better than classical music. Classical music, people have no idea what a beat is. <laughs> and it's pretty boring. <laughs> and trance versus rock. Rock is always some angry guy singing and screaming into the microphone. I don't think it's that great either. Nine Inch Nails is the last year. The reason I bring this up is that my opinion doesn't matter. My opinion matters only to me. And the real answer is in comparison. Too often, we're told, oh, you have to buy Bose because, you know, it's got the best sound quality. And then we look at the price tag, and go, like, oh my god, this is absurd. And it is absurd. What needs to happen, and what you have to decide for yourself, is your ability to listen to sound to the point where you can no longer differentiate quality. That's comparison. If you go out and you buy a $1,000 Bose system and a $500 Kipsler system, and you can't tell the difference in quality, then why would you buy the most people? Think about this for a moment. Recently, and everyone saw this on Slashdot, Dig, and everything else, there was a guy who called $7,000 a pair of cables, cables, you know, only a few feet long, $7,000, danceable. 
And some other guy openly ridiculed the audio file because he was like, what the hell is, what the hell is, you know, how does a cable become dancing? And so he, he openly gave the world a challenge for a million bucks if they could just tell him the difference between the $7,000 pair of cables and the $1,100 pair of monster cables. And no one's come up to him yet for to claim the $1 million prize because you really can't. You have to be kind of the same. So the goal is to compare, to build yourself a reference, to teach yourself, I know what this should sound like, and to go from there. The reason I was mocking, you know, like the other genres is because I do know my I do know my uh, genres. I do know what house music should sound like. I know what clap trance music should sound like. I know what the general tones are. I know what the beat should sound like. And so when I get a piece of hardware equipment and I play my music through it, if I can't tell the difference in quality, then that means that I should have no reason to keep spending money on it. But if I know that my beat should have more of an and the snare drum should sound a little higher, a little precise, then clearly I've got to keep, I've got to look for a different solution. So much of tonight will be based on this comparison theory that says you keep comparing until you can't determine anymore. To get an idea to build ourselves a uh, base of comparison, I want to showcase a little something. Um, the goal is to listen to this track. It's a sample, it's only a minute long. The song is by, called Bottom Tactics by Chicane. So, it's a great song. The goal is to listen to it the first time around on whatever the house hardware here is. But the second time around and the third time around, I'm going to start playing with it. And eventually you'll start seeing what's good and what's bad. And then in your mind, you'll be able to construct what good sound should sound like to yourself. You're not going to have a magazine tell you, this is good, go buy it. It doesn't work that way because we all know the magazine editors are speaking with the manufacturing people. So, if we could, uh, let me uh, figure out where to put this is the original uh, sample. It's ripped from vinyl. And I'll get into why vinyl sounds much better than CD. some sort of difference, right? We all agree to this. There was something about it that said, this isn't right, because you just heard the better thing from before. 
And now for the worst, I'm going to cut the nits. This is like the worst. This is your right hand, so you know something's wrong. That's like the most muffled sound ever, right? There are no nits. Now it sounds like a really bad snare drum in a one LP. Absolute best. 
and find our work. These people are diehard audiophiles, but at the same time, they are all about buying really cheap equipment on the cheap and trying it out and giving it to their friends and family and so forth. AV Forms is a UK website. They're also really big on certain things, you know. Audio Asylum, they have, they break down a lot of the topics for you. You can instantly find a form dedicated to, you know, whatever it is. And DY Audio, for those of you who are truly insane and want to try building your own amplifier or something, is definitely for you guys. For those of you who don't know DIY, you do it yourself. So, a word about audio files. We tend to make fun of them because they're kind of crazy. They kind of just want to bank up their wallets and they'll spend like $500 you know, on the volume knob. And it's true, they do. <laughs> it's like Yeah. But here's the deal. So we make fun of them and we ridicule them, but at the same time, quite often we reap the rewards only they would come to think about. And a lot of what they nitpick and bicker about inevitably ends up in consumer audio because it becomes cheaper and cheaper to build the stuff. You know, like what we spend this cost me about 120, but a few years ago, I mean like maybe 10 years ago, it would cost me 200. Because the price of producing the stuff comes down, and so the quality keeps going up and up and up. So that's what audio files are great for. They find things that might not be scientifically factual, but if it only costs you like one cent to fix it for a bajillion items, you're probably going to do it. You're going to make the assumption, all right, let's do it. So. I'm going to get into some of the stuff they talk about later, but like they talk about jitter concepts, interconnects that they do and don't like, and so forth. And while we can, for the most part, discard their opinions on $7,000 tables, some of the stuff they bring up is home. So now we get to the Linux, Linux aspects of this. And when I installed Linux many, many years ago, 11, I think, or 10, whatever, the first thing I wanted to do was play my MP3s. Because for whatever reason, my sound card didn't work. So that made me want to do it so much more, you know? When it didn't work, it was like, oh my god, now i got to have it. And uh, I had to install these binary only drivers, blah, 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 and eventually that sound enough worked. And it was like, wow. I'm doing the same shit I was doing in Windows, but now it worked. And it became like the biggest deal ever, because I can't stand Windows. So, the Linux today, now more than ever, is so far ahead of Unix the rest of Unix and sound, we have our own architecture for it. It's called the Advanced Linux Sound Architecture, ALSA. And I'll take a moment just to speak about something that's always bothered me. Traditionally, the open source Unixes stay together. Like, even though we bicker with each other and we call each other pretty nasty names and blah, 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 we stick together because at the end, we've all got the same ide ideology, which is open source rocks. And it does. But Linux, has diverged from the rest of the world of Unix, or, open, or even Unix or open source Unix, by having a sound architecture so advanced, no one's really adopted it, and none of the DSDs could because it's GTL based and the DSD license. So part of this kind of bothers me a little that like we're kind of like leaving our brothers over there, it's like, yeah, screw you, and you got this. And they can't adopt it. And if they were to, it'd be pretty difficult. If there are any DSD people here like the Firefox situation, please do so. But this is definitely one of those things that mildly works me because we should all be in it, you know, at the same time. So also does a bunch of things. It provides the audio framework for Linux. You know, it puts everything together. It's like this amazing glue. It's like a uh, gorilla glue. It has driver support, everything from El Chivo cards to like really, really good cards that cost a fortune. Sometimes if you have a free if you have a free moment, just go to the sound matrix they have on your website, explore around a little bit. And it's funny stuff. It's interesting stuff what they support. And they provide an API for applications, which is, you know, oh, I need to do this and this with the sound. Okay, I'll turn it elsewhere. And now for the number one thing going for it, it rids Unix of OSS stupidity. OSS stands for Open Sound Server or Open Sound System. I don't remember anymore. I don't care anymore. OSS used to be what Linux the BSD still used to this day to, provor to provide sound. And the thing that used to bother the living fuck out of me was you could only have one application use the sound card at a time unless you were lucky enough to have it created. Could you imagine? Like, Windows people have been doing this for years, you know? They'll listen to their MP3s, 
watch a video, they'll do whatever they want all at the same time because they can. The sound works instantaneously. Whereas us Linux people, if we had one MP3 playing, that was it. We have to wait till it's turned off to do something else. Elsa got rid of this. Elsa has a version 9.04, whatever it was, pretty much had a built-in uh, mixer called DMix that automatically takes care of everything in a transparent manner. And so many of the stupidity, we had much of the stupidity we had to put on the OS S is gone. And you should all consider yourselves really lucky. Yes? Yeah, but I mean, that's not really true because the CCM multiplexing in Elsa sucks. I mean, it works for like 50% of the cards and then you have to revert to ESB, which is not even contained anymore, but it's the only way to play more than one sound. I realize, uh, well, I knew DMX sucked for other reasons, like it's just poor quality, but I didn't know that the cards issue still existed. Like, I have to run into hardware it doesn't work on. No, but I've had, I mean, I've had just people ask me on, you know, for help on IRC, and I tell them to use DSP, and it's just going to work fine. But I, yeah, I still run into issues where I can only play one sound at a time, or like I'll play something in XMS or Audacious, and then my flash sound will play, you know, Happen. It might happen if you're using any legacy on application that demands OSS. But no, it's new applications that demand yeah. OSS. They're no. stupid. The default is like that. I'm not, but I'm not yeah. using anything that demands OSS. And even if I was, there's a bracket. So. Well, Flash might demand OSS. Well, that's true. You could do that. <laughs> Anyways, well, the solution to this, people, is to buy, is to, well, we'll get to this later. Yeah, we'll get to that later. Huh. Why Windows? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, so here we are now. So you want to buy a new sound card because clearly you hate having a shitty sound card and want something that works. Yes? Um, are you going to talk about MIDI support? I've never got a MIDI to have the device to work on it. I can talk about that right after this. I didn't actually think about it, but I could. To my extent. Yes? A little uh, statement. Some time ago, LR re re released a reporting a digital LP recording of Pondo's Music for the Royal Fireworks. They warned people to keep the volume down low because the output could destroy cheap hardware. Some years yeah. later, when the first generation CDs came out, they re-released the recording on CD. It actually sounded louder and that same warning attached. They might have compressed them. No. But that's so beyond this part of the yeah. session. So you're interested in buying a new card because the one you have sucks and you'd like to do more. Mark? Just out of curiosity, I mean, a lot of level boards nowadays are coming with so much stuff built in that the sound card or video card, of course. Uh, what, what's the use for the sound chips on most of the level boards nowadays? Is it an outside compatible stuff? Okay. Usually because it's so mass produced and it's the cheapest thing that you find. It's almost always guaranteed to work. That's been my experience. We're going to get into that too. Work well or just work? Work. I mean, if you want it to work well, I think you should buy a card. But we're going to get into that. So first, you've got to figure out what you want. Do you want just a little cheap sound card? Do you want like a really fancy one with a little uh, front bay with all the volume controls? What do you want? <coughs> I mean, you have to think about it. The next is to do your research on it. And the internet is like your biggest buyer's guide because you can look up the model of the card and you can see does it work in Linux, does it not work in Linux. This is like much more of a prevalent thing today than it was like 11 years ago when you kind of just saw Linux like I did. You had no idea what you were doing. The next is to check Alice's sound card matrix and it's amazingly good because unlike most sound open source projects, they list everything by vendor and by marketing name. So even if two cards are almost the same thing, but with like one character difference in the modeling, it doesn't matter. Also, we'll list both of them. It's amazing. Like, it really helps out people. And lastly, when you buy a card you weren't too sure of, or you were, or it basically works, contribute. Somewhere on the internet say, oh, I got this and this, and it worked with Elsa. Because then when somebody in the future Googles for the same set of words, you know, they're going to find what you wrote, they're going to see that it worked, and if they believe you, they'll buy it. And finally, there's a growing consensus consensus among many, not even just audiophiles, but like people who care about audio quality, that you should go and buy USB cards over PCI cards. And the reason for this is called PCI jitter. The theory is, is that because you've got a card on a PCI bus,
because all of the digital to digital uh, DACs are there. Yeah, digital to analog converters are there. It affects the sound quality. I have to admit, I can't hear this jitter. That's my comparison. My comparison says this jitter doesn't exist. But to so many other people, this is a growing issue. So maybe you want to buy it in a USB card, maybe you don't. I put it all the way at the bottom, and you're, willing, you're welcome to all Google for it when you go home, PCI jitter, and find out that it really is a growing issue. So let's say you find a really weird looking card like this one. And it's kind of interesting because it's got so many different apps, but you know what they do. But it looks great, and you just want to spend money. <laughs> so I have a theory called the big black chip theory. It almost never fails. Never. This card is the ESI Julia. Uh, Julia spelled J-U-L-I with an at sign at the end. It's a great card I have that on my works with next slide. Let's say you didn't know it did. The big black chip theory says that the most expensive component of any card is the big black chip, and that's what Linux has got to support, because that's the only thing that interfaces with the rest of the system. Everything else doesn't matter. That's where the PCI interface is. That's even our USB device, that's where the USB interface is. So if we were to take this ESI Julia card and peel off the sticker, we would get this. It's a VIA ice ensemble, blah, 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 blah. And inevitably, we could Google for this. And we could look for this chip. Because this, this is what needs to be supported. And then we would find out ALSA does support it. In fact, it's on the bottom. When you realize how hardware is made, then it makes more sense. ESI is a company that's concerned about audio quality. So they work really hard on like <coughs> A card like this. What you guys don't notice is that this card is actually detachable, and you can reverse the top to go from balanced arc to outputs, to unbalanced arc to outputs. That's irrelevant, though. But ESI can't afford to fabricate the big black chip. They can't afford to make it. They can't afford to fabricate. So most companies like ESI and most other resellers will go to an OEM, usually Taiwanese like Via, and say, "Give us a high quality chip." And Via says, oh, we'll sell you one of these, 100000 for like a billion dollars, right? And that's what it's a package. So even though ESI will give you their own drivers and their own applications and all this amazing stuff, at the end of the day, it's still a Via chipset, and that's what needs to be supported. This holds true for video cards, sound cards, USB, almost everything. And most cases, most companies, with the exception of video card companies, will not deviate too far from the original OEM chip, the original black chip. The generic model, in module in this case, I-1724, is guaranteed to work regardless of what happens. So the laptop problem is kind of funny because once in a while you want to buy a laptop and you can't look at them. You can't know what the chipset is. Remember, people buy chips and resell them as their own all the time. What could say Intel on it is actually audio device. This is key for So your first bet is to research. Your second bet is to actually find like this machine at a store and pop an OIC. I don't suggest that anymore. Every day I read a newspaper about some rent a cop having a god complex problem and it's no good. You'll end up your skill, you'll find yourself in jail for like almost nothing and you'll be labeled Paris. It's no good. If you don't know what the deal is, and you have no idea what's going on, my advice to you, and this is done with uh, practice, this isn't done instantly, is to crack, up, crack open the Windows driver. Because you know there's going to be a Windows driver for it. So let's say IBM, which I mean Lenovo or whatever, they, and they're pretty good about it, not bad about it. Let's say they got really bad about it. They put up a brand new C60, and it had like, it just said, you know, integrated live 5.1 audio. And you have no idea what this is. But you know for a fact, if you were to go to support.idm.com, you can download the drivers for it. It's usually an, extra, uh, an executable. The brilliant things about these executables is that they auto automatically extract themselves first before ever attempting to install themselves. And they tell you what they do too. It's like usually C Windows 10 or C drivers or whatever, right? Whatever Windows people use. And it's great. Because so first, you may have to do it in Windows. So if you don't have a Windows machine, you have to go to your friends or whatever. So you have to find where it extracted itself to. 
You have to find, this usually helps, it's not necessary, but you can find a driver specific, uh, directory specific to, like, say, Windows XP or whatever, that's great, inside wherever the driver was extracted. You have to find, you have to look for an INF file. There might be a whole bunch, so good luck. And inside this creepy INF file, you'll find 50 bajillion lines of this and that. But towards the top, usually, there is somewhere a line like this. Uh, let me just highlight it. There's usually a line like this somewhere. You know? It might be on a line with other stuff. Who knows? Maybe what you should do is you should search for PCI backslash event and look for it. This is really critical, and this kind of cuts through the marketing bullshit. Because what it does is it tells you who is the original vendor and what is the device. Every PCI device in the world has a vendor ID and a device ID. <coughs> and this doesn't change because that would mean changing the silicon, which would mean having to go to the FCC to have your little chip recertified. That's a lot of money. They don't do it. In this case, I looked at my Dell. It says it's a Dell stamp card, Dell everything. But I decided to crack open the driver. The PCI vendor, as you can see, is here. It's 8086, for those of you who instantly get the joke, it's Intel. The, de the device ID is 24C5. The number is always in text format, so it will only go from 0 to F. This is great, because now what it means is I can go to the PCI device database Google for it, type in this, and find what the device actually is. I will know what it is in actual silicon instead of what the laptop manufacturer is telling me. That's huge. Because I know for a fact if I go to the PCI database, I type in 8086, I'll get Intel's 50 bajillion devices, then I'll look for a 24C5, and I'll find that's their stereotypical I810 audio uh, chip, which is like you know, bajillion PCs and it's very well supported by Linux. That's how I figured out what was what even though HP or IBM was telling me, oh, it's just the most bland sounding name ever. I know it's a lot of work, and it's not something most people get right on the first try, and you have to have an understanding of how PCI vendor IDs work and so forth and this and that. It's not easy, but we're all Linux people. We're all cut above the rest, so we should be able to figure this out, hopefully. Yeah? Uh, what, what, how you give you some information and no, no, so you can do LSPCI and stuff, right? But this makes the assumption that you want to buy a laptop that you don't own already. If I'm going to IBM.com and they've got a brand new T80 up that same day, and they're telling me just an integrated 5.1 device, that's no good. So when I download the driver and do all this mumbo-jumbo voodoo, I can figure it out, hopefully. So, what to look for when buying a sound card? Because sound cards are like the most basic thing for Linux, you know, audio-wise. Is vendor support? Some vendors will clearly state, you know, when they support creative, it's amazingly good at this. They actually have people who work on this once in a while, you know. Linux support, which is, you know, when some random hacker like Zach Brown is given the code and he gets to make a driver out of it. And word of the mouth, which is, you know, oh, this works, this works, this works. You read that a billion places, it's got to work. What to look out for? So you go to Staples and you like, or Best Buy or Circuit City, right? And you have this $10 card that claims to offer you the world in high fidelity and blah, 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 blah. Probably not, because capacitors and all that little funny stuff, expensive cards tend to have, cost good money. You can't sell it at $10 and expect to make a profit out of it. It's not happening. So, <coughs> if he's got a little card in front of you that says, you know, everything for 10 bucks, uh, and since $10 cards tend to be really cheap, since they tend to, you know, like, be so bare bones, they usually won't put a sticker over the big black ship. Ooh, where is it? There we go. They won't put a sticker like these guys did. You might just be able to look at the chipset and realize, oh, it's a crappy chipset. I don't need to buy this. You know, 
next, and what kind of sucks, is that a lot of these advanced mumbo jumbo features like 3D sound positioning and whatever else might only be available for Windows because it's actually being done in software, not hardware. And because it's cheaper to do it in software and it's less CPU intensive, and so having less powerful chip on the board, you know, costs them less too. So be wary of like any of that stuff because it probably isn't going to happen in Linux, which kind of sucks, but we're music fans here, so as long as we get to hear a favorite rock band, who cares? And finally, OEMs are amazingly good at telling you there is a specific type of card in their uh, machine, but there isn't. And Gateway's amazingly good at this. They used to be, I don't know if they still do it. They used to tell people, oh yeah, you're going to get a creative sound card in your uh, machine. And so these people would buy the machine because they know creative can do multiple sound outputs. And then you get this weird thing with like, I think it was an ESS 1988, whatever the really crappy generic chipset was. But the entire time the packaging said it was created, everything said it was created to Windows users, since Windows does it all software anyway, they don't know this difference, but Linux users do. And that really sucks. So be wary, like, I don't think it's happened in a while. But I don't trust Dell, Gateway, or any of those guys that are telling me the truth. Unless you're buying probably the latest machines from them, in which case it's kind of hard to know that bullshit do. I don't know. Didn't think about that. So now we get to Linux Plus Music. And it's going to be kind of interesting because I have not run the application on this machine yet. It's the first time I do it. We're all kind of doing it. We'll all run into funny problems. We'll all see how it tries to drive our music and so forth. But I'd like to get something straight. I like Audacious a lot because it's very simple, it just works, and it doesn't have a complicated backend. What bothers the hell out of me is that almost every Linux application under the sun needs a backend. It's like you can't find anything that's just a simple front, it just works. You know, like I remember um, many, many years ago when I wanted to try out that Kismet software, that Super M wireless packets and stuff, I thought I could just run this program, right? No, I had a whole front end and back end thing. Or a packet sniffer? Surely amazing. So it really, I hate front, needless front end and back end here. And when, people, when Linux people go out and create front end and back end, they all do the worst job of it. It's like they all forgot how to code Unix at that moment. And then they make the most horrific thing ever with the most ungodly soft place to socket files. Just irritating stuff. I like Audacious. It's very simple. And actually, I should show it. Uh, on, so I'm, I haven't run any of this. is a brand new install. It's a brand new everything. It should be somewhere. Here it is. First run, you know. If it works, it works. If it doesn't, it doesn't. Let's try to play a file and see what happens. I stuck all my files in the video. No, it should be. Let's try uh, something different. Oh. It works. First try. That was good. It's a two hundred thousand dollar bottle. Uh, no, actually, Chicane is not covered by the RIA. Most DJ music, in fact, is not covered by the RIA, which is why we can go to a record store, buy the record, play it at the club the same night, and never worry about it, because it's almost never covered by the RIA. And this is completely. I'll get to it later, actually, but. Thanks for bringing that up. <laughs> yeah, considering it's not your two hundred thousand dollars. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> all right. So then we get to the holy grail of all uh, Linux media players. Every once in a while, or whatever other cases, this is not my screenshot, by the way. There is that you know program that that KDE program that comes out of nowhere and blows everyone away. Years ago, it was K3V when it was like, wow, we don't need Nero, we need K3V on Linux. And now it's Armor Rock, which happens to be quite the feature full, you know, uh, audio player for Linux. Not a big fan of these massive things because I have my own uh, management system, but we're going to get Bomber Arc spin right now, the first time ever, we're going to see how it works, if it works anywhere as well as iTunes does and automatically grabbing your music and sticking in the right directory and stuff. And we'll get a first run feel for it, very much so. You just found it. There you go. I've never run it before, so let's see what happens. All right. It says here, welcome to Armor. That's always the thing. It didn't start the application. <laughs> 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 it 
Alright, next. Please select the folders where your music files are stored. Yeah, you could do this, but I know better. I'm just going to do home. If I could, uh, there we go. Alright, so see, it finds my music and automatically stores it. Just to, for the record. When does you do the director? Yeah, I should do something like that. Oh, whatever. Alright, my music is in pictures for reasons I can't figure out why. Got a Red Hot Chili Peppers album, Paul Fun Book album, and a Paul Looking for the album. So let's see what happens. I hit next. It says, Congratulations, ready for you. So I'll cross your fingers now. Well, that's a window. Whoa, whoa, it's doing some of those guys. See the bottom? Wow. It found everything. It didn't find the album covers, which is kind of interesting because it actually goes out to the internet to find the album covers of your illegally damaged album CDs. <laughs> but anyway, actually, thank you for reminding me. And the last, someone reminded me when I've got like five minutes to go because then I could talk about Linux and peer to peer networking and how to do it safer, like doing it with a condom, you know? <laughs> so let me, uh, <laughs> so I have no idea how, I've never run this program before, but it's like, let's see what happens. I don't say that, that's what it is. I don't say that. So if you're into this kind of stuff, you know, I guess it's for you. I guess you can look at how far, how often you uh, added it by. It's a whole program in and of itself. And I've heard many people talk about this being a program. I can't stand these over intrusive MP3 players because. I have my own system, you know, this doesn't work. I have no idea what Stadium or Arcadian is. Uh, I'm not the most excellent for speaking, but I can only read it. Oh, yeah. Oh, it's like that this TV. Maybe I should read this off. Actually, it's better than that. Alright, so. Armor, I'll let you have playlists, files, to see where your stuff is. Does it have a bit current application? Uh, that would be the whole kitchen. I don't know. That'd be great. But someone remind me, excuse me, last five minutes, we talk about that. Alright, so that was Armor Off. Uh, oh, I forgot. Okay, so the deal with MIDI files is this. Wait, where's the Elzen mixer? The what? I can play music. Where's the Elzen mixer? Elzen mixer? Yes, the mixer with the Elzen. Oh, it's done on transparent. It's what? Demix is done transparent. You don't have to type. You don't have to, yeah, you don't have to run anymore. Van Dreva used to have the funniest little hack for this back when DMX didn't work so well. And you had to choose between ESP if you were known or Arts if you were a KDE. They had a script called Sound Wrapper. And you'd run everything through Sound Wrapper, which would instantly figure out what you had to do, and then it would run it for you. And I thought it was very ingenious because a lot of people got tired of having to figure out if they were using ESP or Arts or whatever. So Van Dreva never mattered because you were just going to using Sound Wrapper. That is when you wanted to actually just mix it. You mean the terminal when you run out? Well, my also mixer has options on there. I don't even know what it's going to What's the ESD uh, emulator? No, no, you're thinking about a volume mixer. That's yeah, I got a lot more. I got a lot more. Uh, this is a pretty that. low quality laptop sound. I was expecting it to have too much. Mine says uh, emu and then it's got a double emu things. I don't know what they are. What do you know? So if you're into like, you know, organizing all your MP3s and so forth, this is the program to get. If I can figure out how to get my, uh, oh, here we go, fresh from Amazon.com. Yeah. Come on, guys, and see if it does it. Wait, I don't have any internet here. Well, sorry. Yes, you do. I do. Ooh, yes. Ah, oh, don't worry about it. <laughs> all right, so now, wait, Alsa never quit, though. Alsa's actually, I mean, Armor is still here. So for you KDE guys, and even a lot of you film guys, Armor Rock is like, the thing to run. For GNOME, if you're like more like you can't stand KDE or you just don't care and you want something simplistic, you have Rhythmbox, which is part of the GNOME project. And if I can find it, if it's a chart, you will see if it grabs my music as well. So the first time we're on that. Well, that kind of sucks. Didn't want to find my music. So it's good. Just to know where the heck it is. Okay. 
Let's see if it does alt home. There we go. All right. And I guess you would just do a double click through music here and see if you play this. So it sorts it by artist, album. Yeah, seems pretty. Oh, it's even got links to stores. That's big because most DRM stores don't work under links, and most non DRM stores don't have anything worth buying. You can do it at Radio Whatever, I also. Yeah, you can, you, I'm pretty sure you can do it with all of them. You can even do it with uh, Audacious. It's not a big thing. The Shoutcast protocol has been open source for like forever. The guy who developed Shoutcast actually got to meet them. They're, they're, they may come from Winamp, but they're very big on Unix in general. They make sure it works on BSD, Linux, and so forth. That's never been an issue, actually. One of the cool things while we're on the topic of radio is the holy grail for radio, for internet radio, is to save on bandwidth because it costs a fortune. I only know of one company digitally imported, which is the world's third or fourth largest radio station. They're independent, so the amount of bandwidth they use is absurd. I won't tell you how they save absurd amounts of money on it, but they do. And that bandwidth doesn't come cheap. It's good quality bandwidth. So the goal is to have as much quality and as little bitstream as possible. One of and Digitally imported is not the only one that does it. The satellite radio provider Sirius and XM do it too. They use a codec called AAC Plus. For the longest time, it's proprietary, still is legally, but Linux people can now decode it and encode it with it when using VLC, the libraries VLCs put out. And AAC Plus is like the thing to have your music streamed in because a 64 bit AAC Plus kilobit stream from AAC Plus beats out a 192 MP3. And so if you are like, if you go to like Jackal Music or whatever and you want to listen to music, see if you have an AAC plus option, because it's going to be worth it. So, uh, I think you stream on FTP stuff. Very good. I don't think you a back end to play fucking FTPs. Sorry, really, I'm doing that. So, now we get to Linux and DAP, DAPs, Digital Audio Player. Yeah, MPP player. MPP player is too long to say, so I say DAPs. The major DAP producers are Apple, SanDisk, Creative, Fireover, and Microsoft. Am I forgetting any of them? I'll take those enough. For the most part, these for the most part, a lot of these work and a lot of these don't work. The best supported is Apple because it's got the holy grail behind it. SanDisk, a lot of SanDisk players are just mass storage. Creative requires a, a lot of creative, not all, but a lot of creative derived by devices require a library. The same thing applies to iRiver and Microsoft. Linux actually runs on the Zoom. Forget just working with it. You can run Linux on the Zoom, which I think is funny. When buying a new digital audio player, you have to first figure what you want. It's the same thing as buying a sound card. You figure what you want, you've got to do research, you've got to check the various forms. And if you bought something that nobody else did or nobody else did, Said on the internet, hey guys, this works. Please do it, you're helping each other out then, you know? So, what to look for? This is kind of interesting. First is vendor support. The vendor tells you, you know, this works under Linux. That's great. Probably a USB mass, audio mass, USB uh, storage device at that point. Word of mouth is great, you know? All of us Linux guys like our iPod, so clearly it's got quite the word of mouth behind it. A lack of a driver is a really good thing. I need to say a lack of a Windows driver. When an MP3 player lacks a Windows driver, and it says it works out of the box, or a Linux driver, it means that it's a USB mass storage device, and all you have to do is dump your MP3s into it. No problems. And this is kind of funny. If you can find, and some of those really weird Taiwanese cheapy things actually say this, if they specifically support Macintosh OS 9.04 and above, that's great because 9.04 was when Macintosh was introduced to USB mass storage devices. So some of them will actually tell you, you know, oh, we support this specific version of OS 9. And that is a big thing because that's when they got uh, USB support. 
Now, I did not align this properly. What to look out for? This is critical. The first is it requires Windows Media Player. Like if it says you need Windows Media Player 10 or above, this could be bad because it might be a play for sure device or it might be a device that requires some kind of wacky DRM scheme and DRM sucks. It's anti American. So, if it says Windows Media Player requirements, research it, be wary, buy or be wary. If it has this epic driver to download, like even more than a meg, even half a meg, it's bad because most USB now storage devices don't need a driver. So the fact that you're downloading the driver might suggest that this may not work under Linux. And a lack of OSX support is bad too because OSX does NAS storage probably better than Windows does. What is it not better than Windows, right? So, if it says Windows only, then it's probably not even compatible with Linux. And general shadiness is like my term for when you have no idea what it's doing and it just seems like it's from a really small company. In that case, why not just spend the extra 10 $20 to buy a name brand for something that you know is going to work? Why just skip? You know? Now, what you don't know, and this is kind of interesting. So I'm a business major, right? And we think about all these funny things all the time. And this is an interesting discussion we had a while back, and I think it's very true. Apple has the most epic following behind the iPod. They can't go wrong. So long as they don't screw it up, they cannot go wrong. Their zealous users will protect them from everything. You know, like Steve Jobs could beat someone up tomorrow, and those zealous users will defend him for doing it. I kid you not. It's truly mind blowing. And anyone who knows me here knows I do not pick Apple products. I can't stand Apple. But the key issue here is let's say you're making a bajillion iPods, right? No, let's say uh, you're making a million iPods. And you've got to buy a component. You can choose between a $5 component and a $3 component. By choosing a $3 component, you save yourself $2 million. You see what I'm saying here? Because of Apple's absurdly incredible following, there is no reason for them to always buy the highest quality audio components. It's true. From the moment Apple's iPod came out, they used a chip, I think of the company's Wolf Play, I forget guys, I mean, you know, it's there's a Wolf in the name. And everyone said, why this? It's such an off-the-shelf component that sucks. There's nothing to it. And today, Apple uses a mass uh, a chip from Samsung that isn't specific to iPod either because it's cheaper, saves them millions of dollars. There's a guy's vacation right there. He's got phones. <laughs> so when you've got the epic following, you can afford to cut such corners because no one's going to complain. The people who are going to complain don't get listened to any of this. They don't. When was the last time you heard any of this? You haven't. If you go and Google for it, I'm not, I'm not telling this like you know, to you right now. So when you're thinking about buying an MP3 card, keep this in mind, a lot of audio files, if you go to head5.org, head an audio file website, where people are all upset about headphones and this and that, most of them will buy Creative Zen because the insides are actually higher quality than the whole thing, than, than the iPod. And in my experience, iPods tend to have short lifespans anyway. So maybe because everyone's using them too much, I don't really know. And now for the iPod paradox. I love this one. People come up to me all the time and they go, oh my god, so many for my MP3 which one should I buy? They go, and Apple's great at this. And not just Apple, but creative and everybody. They'll charge you $250 for the 4-gig version and $300 for the 8-gig version, right? Everyone's saying, if I spend $50 more, I can twice the amount of space. And so they usually do it, which is kind of the point. So they're all spending $300 for these 8-gig iPods instead of the 4-gig ones for $50 less. But once in a while, I tell somebody, you know, why not buy the 4-gig version and take the difference to buy a good pair of headphones? And it's amazing how hostile people are. I'm not kidding. It's like, no, I don't want to do that. And it's like, you're, like, it's true. People will buy the biggest iPod they possibly could for like the most absurd amount of money. But the moment they have to spend a dime on headphones, they don't do it. It's just mind-boggling. And the funny thing is, let me just see if I'm slide for it. I don't know, I probably don't. Okay, I don't. Audio files have an obsession with this company, Coast, K-O-S-S. -S. It sounds like a really cheap brand. It is a really cheap brand. But their ability to make unbelievably quality products for a price you couldn't even imagine is amazing. 
go home tonight and Google for KSC75. It is a $10 to $20 pair of headphones that rivals $50 to $100 pair. I'm not making this up. You can Google for this. And this pair, you could buy JNR right now. It's got the most epic following ever. And the funny thing is, the crappy looking headphones they have, like their other models, have quite a following too. And they're only $15, 20 $25. But they're doing such an amazing job. And I tell my friends this, you know, just go spend a little bit more and you'll get like way better headphones. You can actually listen to your music. I really hate those little white things. And people are just so hostile to this idea. I have no idea why. You know, so I call it the iPod paradox where you clearly have the money but not brain power. <laughs> <laughs> so now we get to uh, letting us spend more audio. And more audio means. I want to do more than just play it. I want to produce it. I want to create it. I'm actually avoiding the whole composition topic because I realize it's really big. Like I could put, bust that hard door right now and you'd be like, whoa. But I don't think I need to push the pixel towards you, so I uh, stay away from it. But the kernel is such an irritating thing about this. It's like our, it's our most favorite piece of software, and I think it's the one that's the most badly managed ever. Like, the more I look at the 2.6 series, the more I think it's a joke. And for those of you who've been keeping track, Linus, our game, apparently, is in control, even though Andrew Warren should be in control. And there's a guy, the Red Hat employee, Ingo Molnar, Tony Nard, that's the name. What? Well, we'll just call him Ingo, that is his name. And this other guy, Khan, from Australia, right? So a while back, this guy, Khan, says, hey, this, this performance is rubbish. So he replaces what's known as schedule or what's something that actually works. And if you've never tried this patch, believe me, we're missing out on another bar. And for the longest time, Linus decides, Sorry, guys. this is not being accepted into the kernel. And it's like, why? So like for the longest time, you guys are running these really bad kernels. And the few of us who actually knew were running these amazing kernels. Like, wow, you really have to try it to see, to experience the difference in quality. And so like, I think 2.6.23 uh, uh, was recent, but sometime last week, earlier, like, you know, like a few days ago, whatever, right? It's finally got this new uh, scheduler. I have yet to try it out, but apparently it's most of what this guy Khan was advocating to begin with, but it's done by a Red Hat employee. I realize there's a lot of back end politics to this, but in order to achieve the highest fidelity audio, the highest quality, you need the most tiniest amount of wax. A piece of information needs to jump between the sound card and the CPU. You need a kernel that allows that to happen as fast as possible because delays suck. So I say the effing kernel because it keeps changing. It's not stable. And it's not that great. And I don't, I'm not. I haven't been impressed the way I was with 2.4. Even 2.4 was not all that great either. Excuse me. So we talk about basic editing and recording. Oh, I meant to put a lot of slash there. For us, it's Audacity. And what I think makes Audacity truly an amazing program is the fact that it works under Windows and OS X, and that it's free and open source. So what ends up happening is that people learn Audacity under Macintosh, under Windows, and then, you know, if they ever decide to try out the Linux side, the application never changed. That's really critical. That's like one of the brilliant things about Firefox. You know, Firefox is the same on everything. If you switch the operating system, it doesn't matter. Let's give uh, Audacity a whirl right now. Once again, I have to not to open it. And Audacity, like many other tools, like many other tools, is very simplistic. Like, people automatically expect audio tools to understand what they want to do and do it. It doesn't really work like that. Well, let's say, like, uh, let's say we were doing what I was doing at home, and I needed to make a sample out of this. This is the original of this. So we import the MP3. I'm going to do two examples here because we're running out of time, actually. Sorry. Yeah, okay. All right. So I'm going to have to do yeah. So we're on 49. Oh, this is only 1.6 gigahertz, guys. I know I'm like old school, so let's give it a minute. And, 
what Audacity and most other MP3 players do, I mean, any sound editing program does, is they automatically extract the file into WAVE because they can understand WAVE, whereas editing a compressed file is kind of difficult, right? And so let's say, uh, not too loud, let's say I needed to, like, you know, I wanted to find uh, 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 a sample, like, you know, so I could have done like it previously. Why am I not hearing I think this is an issue, guys. Yeah, appreciate sure. it. I had a problem like this the other day with this program. Really? Well, it's fine. Did you have a solution? How do you solve it? Yeah. Somebody else was holding EST and would let go of it. We can uh, figure this wow. out. Okay. Traditional Unix style. Uh, 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 case system. Uh, case system on the Nope, nothing's got a grab on the... All right, well, I'm going to edit, and we're going to pretend like we can use music, but we can, you know, since we're running out of time. It's all I use for thinking caps, and I'm So I'm going to stop. So let's say I, I already know what I want, right? I could instantly grab this. This is the way I do it. It could be other ways. I do edit. I did copy. Oh, wow, this is like a new version. I have this old version. It's none of these files. Just me. Right. Oh, that's good. Good. Paste. Bam. That's the sample I'm apparently working on. And let's all pretend like I'm here, right? Mm -hmm. So like most samples and most anything you take a sample of, you always want an intro and an outro. And the intro is just a simple fade in and the outro is a simple fade out. This is kind of funny. People don't mind long fade outs, but they can't stand long fade ins. So I have a theory when making fade ins, it's usually less than three seconds. So I've got zero to three seconds selected. I can do effect, fade in. I've got my fade in. The volume starts at practically zero, works its way up. Fade outs on the other side, you know, grab a little VMD here. It doesn't matter if you grab more. Because Audacity is smart enough to realize, hey, he doesn't actually have it anymore. So I'm starting at like a little past 15, but it'll go past 10, you know, five seconds. And you fade out. And that's it. The song fades out like it does in many other CDs and whatever else. And you've got yourself a little sample of music here. I don't know. That was the first thing. The second thing is. Let's, uh, let's suppose that this part right here. It's too loud, I can't deal with it. You know, like the rest of the parts are kind of quiet and nice. This all of a sudden comes out of you nowhere and goes, bam. It's no good. We do this, this is really good. This is like one of the more helpful things because you can also do it in the reverse settings. I'm going to pop this in. Uh, I'm going to start grabbing. No, 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 no. There we go. I can start grabbing parts and making others tiny too. So now this, you know, I'm doing this for effects. I'm not doing this to actually edit it. As you can see here, yes. it got skinnier. It was like weight loss, but for sound. <laughs> you know, so that's like really helpful because usually the other way around. Usually, why? Let me open. I want to just open uh, one of the samples because I can't deal with it. I don't want to wait forever. So let's, usually it's the other way around. Usually it's, oh, this part right here could use a little bit of boosting, you know, keep this the same. Not too good at this, guys, but you guys see what I'm getting at. 
if I have now increased the volume for this, if we were to play it, it wouldn't sound any low when the game is up on it. Who else could? Now, you can also have multiple tracks, right? So this gets kind of interesting. Let's say, let's say that you wanted to edit only a specific part. You wanted to loop around a specific part, but you wanted to leave it as a whole. This is what I almost did before. Let's say I didn't like, I want to play around this quiet part, right? I do split. Basically, if I can figure out what I was doing, Alright, so I have no idea what I was trying, uh, what I was doing before. And it's a great little trick. Basically, if I didn't screw this up, you would see this, that selected part, on its own set of tracks below. And then you could go nuts on this while leaving the remainings untouched. And when you hit play, it would play everything. If you go to, I think it's audacityteam.org, they have this great little uh, thing on it. And that's a really good way of editing sound because now you're working explicitly with what you need and not with everything around it. So, there we go. Uh, I'm not going to stay. But now, if I, uh, I'm not going to talk about this too much because if you know about encoding and transcoding, you probably don't need me to tell you about anything. I am going to say that major encoders and, and later case transcoders in Linux are lame. Lame stands for lame is not an MP3 encoder, but it is an MP3 encoder. <laughs> it is one of the highest quality MP3 encoders and it's open source and it's like 50 bajillion options and it's great stuff. But thanks to the absurdity of patent law, it's actually can't download it without paying a fee to some random company, I forget who. And it kind of sucks, but a lot of Linux distributions in the United States often opt not to ship with MP3 libraries for that reason. But they make it real simple for you to grab them from the European servers. <laughs> Transcode and Mencoder, which I think are the two biggest transcoding, is they are they take audio and video, not just uh, audio or video as well, from one type and spew it into another. So you can take your DVD and convert it to Exodus. You can take your Exodus and convert it to DVD. You really need to that gets rid of my next thing. All the people love to talk about this. It's called faxing the fax. The theory is this. If I take a piece of paper, a document, and I fax it once, the quality got degraded a little. If I do it again and again and again, the quality got worse. And after a while, it's crap. So, the same holds true for any kind of sourced audio. You don't want to fax it or re-encode it too many times. So every time you do, you, little, you lose a little detail here, you lose a little detail there. And after a while, it, it sucks. And you can actually Google for this. There are people who will take like an MP3 and re-encode it 50 bajillion times backwards and forwards. By the time you listen to it, it sounds like you're listening to sound in the box. Horrible stuff. So now, the, the more fun aspect of this is Linux and DJ. I'm going to say this at the top right now. Linux is not very good for DJ. It sucks. When you're in a party or a club or an event or whatever, and we're not talking like simplistic weddings or anything, where the, but where an event where the music is the reason you go for it, the whole purpose of the, of the music is to never stop. Could you imagine playing like an MP3 on your computer crashed and everyone was dancing start looking at you. It's got to be like the worst feeling ever. It hasn't happened to me yet, but one day, you know, it's going to happen. So, for the most part, back in the day, the theory was, Windows sucks, we should use Linux. And the companies out there, these pretty big, you know, audio companies, actually did stuff for Linux. So it wasn't really that good either. And then Windows XP came out, and XP, like it or not, solved. It works for this sort of deal. So Linux and DJing is kind of like DJing with a bastard child. 
but people like me who can't stand the middle will try anyways. But let's get something straight. Right now, if someone said, okay, go to Avalon and spin, I'd do it on Windows. I'd have to. It's not worth the risk. So, just so I can, because a few other people can talk about sort of stuff, DJ history, a little bit about it. It began with what is known as the Bozak Mixer. This guy, I think he's working in New York City for CBS. He created a really high quality piece of hardware that let you take lots of different sound, combine it into one, and shoot it at the other. Just think about what DJ do, it makes a lot of sense. Then it continued with what is known as the Technics 1200 Mark II. This turntable has been in production for over 30 years, and 30 million of these have been sold, and it is the worldwide standard for turntables. When you see DJ spin vinyl, this is probably what they're using. This turntable never started off intended for DJs. It started off intended for just high quality, high fidelity customers who are willing to spend the difference. Except it's built like a tank. If you drop this down to flight of stairs, it will still work perfectly fine. It really is. And DJs picked up on it because what you guys can see here, this is known as the pitch bender. It lets you speed up and slow down the song. Now, it doesn't sound like a lot of well, what we would want is to speed up and slow down the song. That sounds kind of plain and hard. But it's not. It's actually the entire point of DJ. You see? Oh, it's not going to be Oh, I screwed up the order. I'm sorry. Hold on. Let me have All right, here we go. In the 70s, a bunch of disco DJs realized they could take one, they could take one record and play it. They could put in another record and play that one too. And if they got the beats to match up, to align themselves, they could instantly, flawlessly flip from one song to the next, and no one would ever know. It's the greatest illusion ever. If you ever go to a club where this is happening, you ask people, when did the song end? If they don't know what DJs do, they'll be like, I actually don't know. And it is the greatest illusion ever. So, we are uh, good. DJing began in Detroit and Chicago and New York, particularly Detroit. Chicago's pretty strong in New York, yeah. We had Studio 54 with Larry LeVan. We didn't have too much going for us. And DJ began with house and hip hop. And these are the predominant, you know, because for the time they were the predominant DJ genres. Today is a little different. Today the biggies are London, Amsterdam, and Los Angeles. And the electronica genres have taken up most of the limelight. <coughs> Just to give you guys an example, when you guys go to a Crowbar, Spirit, Avalon, Roxy, or whatever, you spend $20, $40, the DJ there got paid $10,000 for that night alone. And that include, and if he's from Europe, which most of them are, he got paid airfare and hotel accommodation. And on New Year's Eve, DJs like Paul Farduk will make $50,000 for that one night alone as well. These guys could pay serious money. In, uh, I think, 99 or 98, Paul Oakenfold became the first DJ to make over a million dollars a year. This is big money, but people, when we think of DJs, we think of like, guys playing bad music at a bad party or the wedding DJ you all want to kill. These guys take it very professionally. In fact, this is uh, Paul Oakenfold in his younger years, and he's doing what he does best, DJing. This is his very younger years. So, the old terrorists. Now, this is the greatest delusion. I'm going to play a sample, and I want you guys to think of how many songs were played in. The number will surprise you. All right, let's see. Uh, this is three minutes long, by the way. Tell me how many songs were played.
got to test four songs. It was three. And none of you guys noticed because that's how flawless the whole process has become. In this case, I cheated a little. I took a clip of one of the world's best DJs who spent three days in front of his computer cramming 200 songs into two hours. Flawlessly. Completely flawlessly. I cheated a little. I chose something that I knew would trip most people up. But it was pretty impressive, right? You didn't notice that there were three songs, three different songs by different artists, different everything, played all together. That. They play on the same time? Yeah. They switched from one to another. What? Well, the Yeah. But that's pretty much it. It's quite the illusion. Yeah. So, so the uh, three songs you're saying all played continuously. No, no, no. no one no. played and then it blended into right, so the next one. Two mixes. It's, okay. also, it's, it's continuous yes. sampling that's synced perfectly. Yeah, that's pretty much the deal. It's the greatest illusion. And when you're at a club, right, this is what drives people. Music drives people. So the goal of the DJ is to never stop the music, is to keep going. Some DJs make it a point by stopping and switching up. It's called breaks, but they're known for doing that. That's when you expect it. And it's not an easy uh, skill to master by any stretch of the mind. You guys do get paid a lot of money for it. And it's the most fun, though. It's like what really drives people. Like a lot of people think of DJs as guys with records who scratch. And there are a lot of us who don't. We are called the precision genres, and we care about mixing more than scratching. In fact, some of us won't will never publicly scratch it. Yes? The pitch of the three songs was different, so it was obvious that some of us who listen to that type of music a lot. Yes, to so those of us who do, we instantly pick up on it. They can't fool us, which kind of sucks, because when you're new to the music, you're like, how did they do that? <laughs> then when you find out, it's like, oh, that sucks. Now I know. <laughs> isn't, isn't there a Linux uh, mixing software? Yeah, there is. Mix and, and I think it's real-time DJ something or Oh, so just, I'm going to that. Just for the record, this was Armin Van Buren, a sample from a state of trance episode 200. There's no artificial intelligence that can do this by itself. No. There is, mm, but no. it's nowhere as accurate as human here. There is. In fact, some time. if you guys go to like Aeropostale or Abercrombie and Fitch, you'll notice the music there never ends either. The, the retail companies have figured out about this concept, so they use the same program that these guys do, and the music never stops. Because when you're shopping, it's like, yeah, probably, you know. <laughs> so analog versus digital. This comes up in DJing like this other tomorrow. It's like, you know, you guys fight about distros. We fight about vinyl records or CD or MP3s or what, you know. Um, to start off with the digital side, I'm like, so right now. We've got Mix. Mix is like the best Linux program, but it's kind of incredibly lacking. I won't get into why, but basically only works it needs to require two SAM cards instead of one. DJs here will understand why that really sucks, but it's getting there. It's open source. The hardest part about software like this, and you can see it right here, is this. This right there. Yep. It will let you speed up and slow down the song. That algorithm is not easily recreated in a quality fashion. In fact, companies like Serato make it a business to resell that kind of software just to slow down the speed of songs. The second is commercial, proprietary, and it runs on Java, meaning works on OS X, Windows, and Linux, called Ultramixer, and this is Ultramixer version two. These, the, all these screenshots are usable from the actual company. And it's a lot more advanced, it has a lot more features, but I found that since it's still relatively a new application, it kind of sucks because it's uh, Java based. And I'm not a big fan of Java anymore. But it looks promising, and being the fact that it works on three simultaneous platforms, you know, the Windows and Mac people who will honestly drive the sales will at least let the company profit, and hopefully they'll still keep the Linux version around, you know? Hopefully. So now we get to a much more amusing concept. This is, I think, the best solution. It's called digital vinyl emulation. There is, this isn't a new concept either, but it's really taking off now, and the most popular, uh, version of this is called Rain. It's from Rain called Serato Scratch. The concept is this. The vinyl we are using is regular vinyl, but it's been time-coded. 
It's not regular songs. It's got a tone that doesn't make sense to us, but it tells the computer this vinyl is at a certain point. Vinyl, for you guys who don't know, spins outside in. So I put the needle right here, it'd be at like a minute and 30 seconds. Or if I put it right here, it'd be like 10 minutes. The computer, this signal gets read from here, sent to that machine, the scratch block live box. It's not that big, it's like this big, you know, nothing else. Which then sends it to the computer. The computer maps it to an MP3. The MP3 is here, and the signal from the vinyl is here, and they're mapped. So, and then it shoots it back to the machine, which shoots to the mixer, which shoots to the speakers. So this is what happens. Let's say I downloaded this amazing song, right? Like the ones I was playing here. But I don't have the vinyl for it just yet, whatever the case is. I can use this to manipulate the song via vinyl. Meaning, when I, on the computer software side, say, use this song, and I backspin on the record, it'll sound just like real vinyl. It'll sound like I actually owned the original plastic, even if I didn't. And what's great is that your record will never get old because you have the MP3. You're actually using the MP3. Is this making any sense at all? I know it's a very yeah, abstract yeah, yeah. Don't they have, this, don't they have a, a, an electronic equivalent of the two keyboards where it's just two pads and you can... Yes, some, some, there are some people just don't even bother with this and they have two circles that they can instantly manipulate, go backwards, forward, wherever they want. But this is now like taking off in the DJing world because nothing gives you the control of a turntable. But let's be honest, when you play that song for like 50 times, it starts showing its age, you know. It kind of sucks because this stuff isn't cheap either. I love how iPod people complain about 99 cents a track when we spend 10, 12 dollars a track for a piece of plastic and more if we have to import it from Europe. So there's clearly a different economy to it too. So this is digital vinyl emulation. Now, this is really funny. The first mass-produced version of digital vinyl emulation was for Linux. Oh, the guys at Stanton said, hey, this Windows is crap, it's not gonna work. So they released Final Scratch 1.0 and 1.1 for Linux and Macintosh, because Windows sucks. <laughs> and it worked, barely, haphazardly. But then at that point, XP came out, and they switched over to XP, because more, not too many DJs are very computer savvy at times, so the idea of having to run an entire operating system was one little trick to see how it works it now. But it still exists, you can, it's hard to find. If, you want, if you're interested in this, you gotta buy it now, because believe me, you can't find too many people selling this old version of this stuff anymore. But along came a bunch of guys called X-Wax, the British group, and they said, we can take these devices that are nothing more than simplistic USB devices, and we can make it work with Linux. And this is where XWAX comes in. XWAX works with Final Scratch 1.0 and 1.1, and the stuff that originally worked with Linux. And they work with Rain SL1, which is the device I just showed you, which is the most popular device. So this looks promising. This looks promising. It looks like it could actually get somewhere sometime. When? I don't know. And when will a DJ actually use this in front of a live crowd? I don't know either. It has to be tested, you know, like, we are very finicky about this because if we're up there and we're playing music and it stops, who's the crowd staring at? Who's not themselves? <laughs> you know? And now, on the bottom, Final Scratch 2. So, Stanton went back to John Borg and created Final Scratch 2. The problem with Final Scratch 2 is their software partner dumped the Native Instruments said, bump this, we could do it on our own. They think about it on their own. So Final Scratch 2, open, it's actually open source digital vinyl emulation. Stanton says, we'll give you the specifications, we'll give you all that you need to build on this. We want you guys to build on it. I haven't seen anything come out of it just yet, but I'm open, you know, it's a nice piece of hardware, and I really just don't want to play those. That's it. Sonny, that, that was absolutely fascinating. Thank you. Um, could you, I mean, I'm thinking about the number one objective, which is don't let the music stop. And when I think about a mission critical application in Linux, say a banking application where you're talking about a lot more money at stake, you have high availability. And in this day and age, the new concept is virtualization. Well, I can have multiple 
uh, guests, multiple VMs, whatever you want to call them, uh, and quick, quick, less than a hundredth of a second migration of that entire desktop, that entire server operating system from one piece of physical hardware to another. Okay, fine. So <laughs> what, is the, what is the possibility of high availability for DJing on Linux for the virtualization, issue, perhaps? The issue and the holy grail of all digital DJs is incredibly low latency. Meaning, the moment they put their hand on the record, stop the stop, speed up the stop, slow down, stop, whatever, they need to hear it as well. If what Brain and the other competitors in this arena do is they actually advocate, they actually advertise response times of seven milliseconds. Okay. The, simple, the simpler the model, the faster the response time. Like if you have a Spyware and best Windows machine, it won't make a difference. But if you have a brand new Windows machine with like almost nothing in it, and you run this server out of scratch or M audio fork, whatever, you know, the response time is phenomenal. And to you guys, seven milliseconds doesn't sound like a lot. But it is. Because when you're engaging in that flawless act of deep mixing, you know, where everything's going to be perfect, it starts adding up really fast. I don't think I've seen any one of these vendors advertise something higher than 22 milliseconds. Even though it could be, because people have shitty PCs, I don't think I've ever seen them advertise anything higher than 22. No, just, just a funny piece of info. We all think of Macintosh as the best platform for multimedia. The reality is Windows is actually Windows XP is actually beating Macintosh in the legacy department. Why? I can point the links and it's like amazing stuff to reach that can be for hours on it. But yeah, it's actually if you Windows XP is the number one platform to do this on. This added, this added. Yes. Uh, actually if you're concerned about the a what? Oh, oh we tell them. I see. The problem with that, yes. Yeah, yeah. The problem with that is you have to install an entire operating system. You have to, like, yeah. DJs don't want to do that. Cause but pretty much, like, how, like, give them the whole idea. Like, At that point, they'll just stick CD players. At that point, there's no reason to do any of this when they could just have CD players, which have like maybe 0.1 MS response. You know, so. Yes. Um, I kind of talk really fascinating. I just want to know if you could comment on, uh, you know, you showed um, software that's used in, in um, audio editing, but the, is, is there stuff out there that could be used in sound synthesis or something yes. like that? Yes. In fact, when I was, uh, like over the weekend when I was just trying to jog my memory about a lot of this stuff, I found this really cool program that like emulates 60 different vintage uh, synthesizers. Like it's out there. It's definitely, if you go to linuxaudio.org and you click on the partners link, they've got all these really cool applications you've never heard of. Yeah. It's just, I mean, there's, there's really cool stuff out there. I'm not going to say it's going to beat Windows or Apple or anything, but it's there. It's cool. <coughs> Any other questions? Yes. I'm going to ask you that for the process. What do you think is the best uh, iPod management package on Linux? Because I guess it would be Armor Rock. I don't have an iPod, so I wouldn't actually you know. I have a simple USB device, you know, you just dump songs into it and like, pop on your merry way. <coughs> I'm not a big fan, as you guys have noticed, about things trying to control how I control music. I'm a DJ, so I've got like 50 bajillion songs. I've got my management structure in front of me, like, don't mess with it, you know. <laughs> Alright, you, I promise you. Oh, well, my, my. Oh, the Navy, right? Yeah. Okay, so this gets funny. I, I, I learned this a long time ago. A lot of MIDI in Linux, I mean Windows, is not done on the hardware side. It's done on the software side with proprietary samples. This sucks for Linux because those are proprietary samples we can't use. So while that, a bunch of guys call it timidity, that's a great idea. We do software emulation of MIDI playback. We could actually make it so that dev sequencer, I think it's sequencer, right? Yeah, dev sequencer <coughs> points at timidity. Yeah. And it acts like a needy server. So when you play the needy, it would actually be run by the software transparently. I know at one point Mandriva thought of integrating this. For whatever other reason, they didn't do it. I know Ubuntu thought of it, but they didn't do it either. I don't, I don't even know if Timidity is well uh, maintained anymore. Yeah, it is. But it exists. Timidity plus plus is up. Oh, see, I don't know. I've not had to deal with this stuff. I have so two well. MIDI cards on my computer, so yeah. Oh, okay. Well, he's the guy that asked all these questions. Yeah. Any other questions? Are you going to the bar? Uh, because I want to ask you more questions. Yes. Yeah.
Right. You and then you. Yes. Why has this? Why has there been a problem with taking video and audio like that? Okay. Big tip, guys. When dealing with MP3 processing under any operating system, not just Linux, use CDR, constant bit rate. It takes up more space, but almost every piece of hardware and software out there will love you for it. When you guys start using DVR on Xfit videos, that's where you get that delay. Now, MPlayer and DLC for sure have really easy keyboard shortcuts that increase and decrease the delay to make it sync with the video. I forget what the key buttons are, but definitely it's uh, one of those very well-known issues when amateur <coughs> coders use DVR because they think, oh, I'm saving space, but they're making a headache. Yes? You had mentioned about before you finished five minutes before you wanted to talk something about it. Ah, yeah, okay, this is great. So we all want to download music legal. <laughs> right? Legal is illegal. Illegal. I don't want to talk about the great area stuff right now. Now, in Windows, they have this amazing application called Peer Guardian. Peer Guardian is great because it blocks out entire sub ranges from ever touching your machine in any way, shape, or form. Now, Peer Guardian is great for Windows. It's open source for Windows, too, so something you can trust. The problem is, it doesn't exist on Linux until recently, like maybe two months ago. A guy created an application called Moblock. M O B L O C K. Moblock takes Peer Guardian's IP ranges and runs IP table rules on them to block them out. Now, the reason you can't just run 50 bajillion IT table statements is because your networking stack will be the slowest thing on the planet. There's actually a tool for this called IPQ that helps you deal with this. The great thing about Moblock is that if you combine it with a piece of software called Firewall, it's a firewall, a firehole, F-I-R-E-H-O-L, to look for it, it becomes like the condom for Linux. <coughs> I'm not kidding. I know it sounds funny, but it's true. This is what you've got to do unless you want the RIA knocking at your door. It sucks. Definitely the thing focus. It makes it so simple. It's like, wow. It sucks for you then. Any other questions? Yes. Yeah, you're going to the bar. Oh, maybe. Uh, Come on. I'll watch you back here. Come on, I'll buy you a drink. That's it? All right, let me pass. Sonny, Sonny, come on. Come on. One more question. How about two more questions? Two more questions. Yes. All right, two more guys. We got two previews here. Come on. What software would you use for the download podcast? I guess Armorock would do it too. Because it's, it's an XML file format that I do know for sure. Bash Potter. You can do RSS tags after that. Yeah. Uh, you make your podcast using Audacity. Yeah, right. And then you put your links up on your website. And the RSS question is if I want to download one. What? If I want to download one. Podcast. There's tons of stuff for that.